Okay, um, Knowing Grace, part seven. It's this week and next week, and then the series is finished. Um, I want to read one verse, just one verse. Romans chapter seven, verse 19. This is a verse, and I've shared this before, but this is a chapter, Romans seven, and in particularly, this is a verse that saved my life when I was a young Christian and naively thought that once I became a Christian that most of my problems would be behind me until I discovered that once I became a Christian, I realized I had a hell of a lot more problems than I thought I had before I was a Christian. And Romans chapter 7, verse 19, absolutely saved my life. This is what the Apostle Paul says. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I want to begin with a quote from Robert Capon, who I've quoted many times. Outside of the Bible, no one has penned more potent sentences or paragraphs on grace than Robert Capon, who died a number of years ago. Probably my favorite author, He said this, people always assume that the church's primary business is to teach morality, but it isn't. It's to proclaim grace and free forgiveness for all. It's to announce the reconciling relationship of God to everybody and to invite them simply to believe it and celebrate it. Potent, true. I think what sets the sanctuary apart from other places is our myopic, laser focus on grace. We don't believe, at least I don't believe, uh, and I assume, hope, that you don't believe this either, but we don't believe that grace is one part of the Christian message. We believe it is the Christian message, and that it's the only hope that any of us ultimately have. It's the only hope for humanity. Someone once asked me what countercultural preaching is. That is, how should the message of the church be different from the messages we get from culture? Someone, an interviewer, asked me that a number of years ago, and I answered in one sentence. I simply said, countercultural preaching is preaching an it-is-finished message in a just-do-it world. That's what it is. We live, as you know, as you've felt it, we live in a performance-driven world where our value is exhaustingly tied to our performance. That's the world we live in. We're constantly being told what to do, what to buy, who to become, how to change, all of that stuff. And I think we need relief from that. I I know I need relief from that. And I talk to people around the world every week who are crying for relief from performancism, from this idea that our performance in whatever capacity determines our value, determines our worth, determines our significance. But sadly, many churches have become one more venue for performance evaluation. Lots of books and sermons and even songs are constantly peppering you with things like, are you getting better than you were? Are you serving more? Are you giving? Are you spending time with God in prayer? How's your relationship with God? And the list goes on and on and on. I was thinking the other day as I was driving back from Boca, I went down there to uh, work out with my son Nate and have dinner with he and his girlfriend Jackie. And as I was on my way home, I was thinking to myself, you know, churches, and I've been in them my entire life, my entire life, I was born in them. But churches are filled with people pretending to be better than they are. Filled with people pretending to be better than they are. I never felt safe totally being myself with other Christians. In fact, the only Christians I actually feel totally self, totally 
what, like, the only Christians I feel totally comfortable being myself with, that's it, uh, are you guys. That's it. That's it. Uh, and a few other ragamuffins around this country. Um, but I never felt safe totally being myself around church people. Never. I always felt like I needed to be better and cleaner to fit in with the church crowd. They've never felt like my people down deep. The people that I feel most comfortable with are people who are honest and real and raw, unedited, unmasked, people who aren't afraid to show their real selves, people who know that they're broken, people who know what it's like to lose. Those those are my people. And those aren't the types of people that are typically attracted to church and churchy things. That's why church and churchy things have never really felt right with me. The church should be the safest place to tell the truth about yourself, but too often it's, it's the scariest, and there's a reason for that. That is a direct result of believing that Christianity is all about our performance for God, that it's all about becoming a better person. When that's the primary message, when that's the message that is either explicitly stated or implied, then the people who know that they're broken typically stay away. In his book, Life Together, which is an amazing book that I highly recommend by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote this, and this was back in the 30s he wrote this, the 1930s. <laughs> the pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. So everybody must conceal his sin from himself and from the fellowship. We dare not be sinners. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered amongst them. So what happens? We remain alone with our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is that we are all sinners. But it is the grace of God, which is so hard for the pious to understand, that says, you are a great, desperate sinner. Now come to me as the sinner that you are because I love you. God wants you as you are. He doesn't want anything from you, a sacrifice, a work. He wants you. The mask you wear before others will do you no good before God. He sees you as you are, and he offers grace to the real you. You don't have to go on lying to yourself and others as if you are better than you are. You can dare to be a sinner. Thank God for that, he says. When we wear a mask, only the mask gets loved. That's true for all of us. You see, what makes the Christian message unique and relieving is that it's not about us. It's not about our performance. It's not about the work that we do. Rather, it's about Jesus and the work that he has done for us. Us. That's what makes the Christian message unique. Which is why, as I said a few minutes ago, I always say that the job of the church is not to say 10,000 different things, but to say one thing 10,000 different ways. We have one silver bullet in our chamber. That's it. We named this place the sanctuary because we want it to be a refuge a place that is safe to be real, a place where it's safe to bring your whole self, not just a part of you, but all of you, the self that laughs and the self that cries, the self that loves and the self that holds grudges and hates, the self that dreams and the self that gets depressed, the self that is greedy and generous, the self that is confident and insecure, the self that is courageous and cowardly, your whole self, all of you. I can speak for myself, but I think I can also speak for just about everybody on planet Earth when I say that I tell the truth and I lie. 
I live out in the open and I hide. I give and I take. I'm self-controlled and I'm reckless. I have an enormous capacity to be faithful to those I love and an enormous capacity to hurt them with all forms of infidelity. That's me. That's who I am. That's who we all are. A bundle of contradictions, every single one of us. And I think that the more we are able to admit that stuff, that truth about ourselves, the healthier we are. And the more God's grace becomes amazing to us. And the more our lives are marked by laughter and relief because we know that God loves us no matter what. But until we can admit the truth about ourselves, grace will seem boring, dry, bland. We'll say things like, can we move on now? Yes, grace, but. And anytime someone says that to me, I always think to myself, and sometimes I say out loud to them, if you really knew yourself, you would never say something like that. If you really knew what you were capable of, if you really knew the contradictions inside of you, if you really knew how selfish you could be, yes, you're giving at times, and yes, you're loving at times, but even our giving and our loving is mixed with selfish motives. None of us have ever had a pure motive for one second in our lives. Never. We came into this world a mixed bag, and we will leave this world a mixed bag. We are contradicting people that live with a bundle of contradictions within our own hearts. And so the safest place to admit that stuff should be the church. But all too often, it's not. I know the word grace is heard a lot in church culture, there's a huge difference, as you've heard me say before, there's a huge difference between grace on paper and grace in practice. Huge difference. Talking grace is easy, especially when everybody's behaving well. Especially then. No perfect people allowed. We love mantras like that in church mission statements and on t-shirts. We love that stuff. Uh... How oh, should I say this? My professor Steve Brown used to tell us when we were in preaching class in graduate school that if you're ever standing behind the pulpit and you think to yourself, should I say this? Say it! <laughs> Always. And if you know anything about Steve, you know that that's been true for him his entire life. Um, but there is a church that will remain unnamed um, that has the, that mantra. I know there are a lot of churches that have the no perfect people allowed mantra, but there's one in particular that I'm thinking of. And uh, I mean, it was everywhere. It was on, you know, it was on their marquee. It was on their t-shirts. It was on their website. I mean, that was like their mantra. Okay, no perfect people allowed. And the pastor of that church was a friend of mine. In fact, I preached at that church a couple of times. And then when everything went south with me and I became a pariah, because of everything that went down in 2015 with me, getting divorced, losing my job, my life, all of that stuff. I called this guy. I'm like, There's a, I know a guy I can call. I can call this guy. I mean, no perfect people allowed. This is the banner under which he lives his life. The guy would not even return my phone call. Okay, now I don't hold a grudge against this guy, not really. Sometimes I do, like when I'm talking about him, like in this very moment, now I'm starting to get angry all over again. It's a mistake to bring it up. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, but in that moment, I realized there is a huge difference between grace on paper, which sells well, and grace in practice, which is messy and dirty and uncomfortable. So we don't want to be a place that's all about grace on paper only. Yes, grace on paper is important. It's important to define it, to understand it, to realize what it is. But grace in practice is where it's at. That's what ultimately matters. 
Uh, how do we treat people when they're behaving badly? How, what do we do with people when their imperfections are acted out? That's, that's grace in practice. I mean, talking grace is easy, but what we truly believe about grace is revealed in how we respond when someone really screws up. That's why, my friend, Paul Zoll, who wrote a book entitled Grace in Practice, never left my side. When I was going through hell, some of the hell that was coming my way and some of the hell that I caused myself, when I was walking through the valley of the shadow of death and I was lying and manipulating and trying to spin the narrative in my favor so that I would gain acceptance again and possibly get my old life back, willing to jump through whatever hoops I could jump through, pretending I was more sorry about my sin than I actually was. I can feign repentance with the best of them. And Paul knew what I was doing, and he never once left my side. And I asked him years later, why didn't you bail? Everybody else did, and I gave you every reason in the world to bail. I was telling you half-truths. I was trying to manipulate things, even in my conversations with you. And he just said, Tully and I, I understand the human condition. I understand Romans 7. I understand that we're a lot worse than we think we are. So sin doesn't shock me. I'm saddened by everything that's happened, and I'm saddened for you, but I'm not shocked by any of it. I expect sinners to sin. I expect broken people to break things. I, I expect fallen people to fall down. Um, when our imperfections are acted out, that's when, that's when what we truly believe about grace is exposed. Um. Because a lot of churches think that God's primary goal for you is to make you good because a lot of churches believe that their mission is to make you a better person and that God's primary goal for you is to make you good. Because that's true, they don't know what to do with you when you're bad. They have no clue. They don't have a category for that stuff. Um, they start questioning whether you even know God. Because someone who truly knew God wouldn't behave this way. They wouldn't screw up this badly. They wouldn't act this out in this way. They have no category for sinners, like Bonhoeffer said. When it comes to grace, there's usually an unspoken flat earth theory that accompanies it. In other words, there's an edge. And if you sail beyond that edge, if you screw up too badly, you're going to fall off. That's sort of an unspoken theory, the yes, grace, but culture that is so pervasive inside the church. But I believe God's grace has no edge. It goes round and round and round in a 70 times seven kind of way. And so I believe church should be the safest place to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about ourselves. And it's sad and maddening to me that it's not, should be. You find a lot more truth telling sitting in a circle at a recovery place with people at rock bottom than you do in most churches. And that's sad to me. It's maddening to me that there are so many people out there that have a view of God and a view of Christianity that forces them to pretend that they're better than they are, to conceal the worst parts of themselves. In my messages, and if you've been here for a while, then you know this to be true. In my messages, I'll never tell you what to do or how to live. Isn't that irresponsible of me? I mean, I'm the preacher, you know? I'm the, I'm the guy that's supposed to tell you what to do. The guy who's supposed to tell you how to live. But you'll never hear that stuff from me. And, and that seems strange because preaching today has almost become synonymous with tell people how to live. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not at all the way it's supposed to be. Most of us know what we should and shouldn't be doing. I mean, if you're, if you're halfway sane, 
You know what you should and shouldn't be doing. You know how you should be living. Most of us know that we need to be better at loving others, that we need to be less distracted and more present with those that we love. Most of us know that lying and stealing is bad, that adultery and selfishness and jealousy and laziness are bad. We know that stuff. Most of us know that being patient and kind and loyal and generous and empathetic and sacrificial is good. We know that. We don't need someone telling us that. We know that that's true. Most of us know that bullying and greed and pride and self-pity and breaking promises are bad. That gossiping and ingratitude and rudeness aren't good things. We know that. We know we should probably be praying more, encouraging more, forgiving more, trusting God more. We know these things. We we know all of these things. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that the moral law is written on our hearts, that our very consciences bear witness to what's right And what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what's true and what's false. So our problem is not that we don't know what to do. Our problem is that we don't do it. That's the problem. Information is not our problem. I mean, I can't tell you how many sermons I have heard where the preacher will get up and rant and rave about, for let's just say, the dangers of pornography, which obviously are true, okay? But I'm sitting there thinking, dude, do you not realize that any person in this room, man or woman, who struggles with this doesn't know that this is destructive? I mean, they, they know it's destructive. They have to do it in secret. They know they would, be, they would be outcasted if anybody found out. Their issue is not knowing whether or not it's bad. Their issue is that they can't stop. They're in the throes of an addiction that's ruining their lives. What are you going to say to that person? So this idea that we have to, I have to stand up here, you know, like your mother, (laughs) and tell you what to do and how to live. You don't need that from me. You know that stuff. You know it. You've lived in this world long enough, most of you, some of you longer than others, uh, and you know that stuff. You know what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false, what's good and what's bad. You know it. That's not the issue. Our problem is not that we don't know what to do. Our problem is that we don't do it. That's our problem. Our problem is that we know what's good and right, and we often do the opposite, That's exactly what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 7, verse 19. Exactly what he's saying. When he says, the good I know I should do, I don't do, and the bad that I know I shouldn't do, I keep doing. And he goes on and on in that chapter and finally ends by saying, who will rescue me from this body of death, O wretched man that I am? That's self-awareness. And then that bleeds right into Romans chapter 8 where he looks away from himself and he looks to Jesus and he goes, but thank God, in him, in him there is no condemnation. That there is an unconditional love that loves me whether I'm good or bad, whether I'm doing what's right or wrong. Nothing can separate us from the love of God because God's love for me is not dependent on what I do, how well I behave, what I don't do. It's dependent entirely and exclusively on what Jesus has done for me. That's our connection to God, not our moral performance or our resistance of the bad stuff. So our problem is not that we don't know what to do. Like Paul, our problem is that We know what to do, and we know what we shouldn't do, and we often do the opposite. That's our problem. In other words, our problem is not, as I said, a lack of information regarding what's right and wrong. Our problem is a heart problem, not a behavior problem. It's an internal problem, not an external problem. Jesus said, it is from the heart that all manner of badness comes. And what's interesting about that is we always focus on changing behavior, always. 
Behavior modification has become synonymous with Christianity these days. We're always focused on the external. We're always focused on behavior. Um, But God's always focused on the heart. It's always focused on the internal. In fact, Jesus, even with the Pharisees, was always sort of digging through the externals and getting to the heart of the matter. In the Sermon on the Mount, which I've preached through here, when he says things like, you've heard it said that uh, if you commit adultery, that you're breaking God's law. But I tell you that if you have ever lusted for one second in your heart before God, you're just as guilty. What's he doing there? He's getting to the heart of the matter. You've heard it said, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, you've heard it said that uh, if you commit murder, you're breaking the law, which is true. And then Jesus goes on to say, but I tell you, if you harbor a grudge against anybody, you have already committed murder in your heart. So Jesus is always, we're so focused on the outside, on the externals, on behavior, and Jesus is always laser focused on the heart of the matter. As Winston Churchill once said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart echoing Jesus' words with that statement. So the only message that is ultimately helpful is not here's what's wrong and here's what you need to do about it, but rather here's what's wrong and here's what God has done about it. It's the only message. So week after week after week, I will do my best to excavate my own heart because I know it's not much different than yours. And by excavating my own heart and diagnosing myself, I believe that I'm excavating your hearts and diagnosing you. And as a result of doing that, hopefully you, me, and the rest of us, will, our eyes will be open just a little bit more, that will become just a little bit more self-aware. And the more self-aware we become, the bigger God becomes, the more amazing his grace becomes, the more appreciative we are of his mercy and his forgiveness and his love. And we begin basking in that and resting in that and worshiping him for that stuff. The only message that changes the the heart is here's what's wrong and here's what God has done about it. Full stop. Anything any preacher says after it is finished is an exercise in unbelief. This is what I mean by that. When I was in graduate school and I was uh, learning about history, philosophy, theology, and preaching, One of the things that one of my professors said, not Steve Brown, um, one of the things that one of my professors said was, your job as a preacher is to look at the text, understand what it's saying, communicate what it's saying, but that's not, you're not finished when you do that. Then you have to get to the application section of the sermon where you are now applying this stuff, in essence, telling people how to apply this stuff to their lives. And that always rubbed me the wrong way because it it always seemed like, okay, we're focusing on Jesus first and then we shift the focus back to ourselves. Why don't we end at Jesus? Why do we end with me? It sounds noble, but it's actually very narcissistic and very enslaving. So I kind of switched it up a little bit and said application is extremely important to me. I think application should be a massive part of preaching, but it's not application in the way we typically think about it. It's not me applying this. It's reveling in the fact that God has applied his grace to me, that God has assigned, that God has applied the blood of his son to me, that God has given me his righteousness. That's the application that matters. Not our application, God word, but God's application to us, on us, for us. So that's the only message that changes the heart. It's always love, not law, that changes hearts. Always. Remember, it's God's job to change people. It's our job to love them. That simplifies my relationship with everybody on planet Earth. That means I don't have to fix anybody. I don't have to change anybody. I mean, when I was in my you know, 20s, I thought I could change myself. 
Uh, I thought I could change the world. I thought I could change my kids. I thought I could change just about anything if I put my mind to it. And now at 51, almost 52 years old, I realize I can't change myself. I can't change the world. I can't change my spouse or my kids or my friends. I can't change anybody. And that's actually very relieving because it simplifies my relationship with everybody on planet Earth. My job is not to fix you. My job is not to improve you. My job is not to change you. My job is to love you. It is God's job to change people. He's the only one qualified to do it. And it's our job to love people. And it's our love for people that God uses to change them. Ironically, the people that God has used to change me the most in my life have been people who haven't tried to change me. They've just loved me. And that love for me, in spite of the fact that I'm not changing, changed me and continues to change me. It's always love, not law, that changes people. I've said this before, but we don't fall in love with people who say, love me better. We feel close and fall in love with people who say, I love you no matter what. That's the announcement of the gospel. It's God saying, I love you no matter what. I have settled the score I've closed the books. You can get off your performance treadmill now, and you can rest under a banner that reads, it is finished. Just spend your life enjoying the gift. I think I shared this. This picture came to me a few years ago um, where I was thinking about what, what word picture could I paint to help people understand this? what the Christian life is really about. Because I've heard it all through the years. The victorious Christian life, where we're victorious over sin, the conquering Christian life, all of that. So I, I heard it all. And it never seemed to fit, which is why Romans 7 helped me so much and saved my life. Because I had heard some of that stuff, that victorious Christian life stuff, my whole life, and I was still wrestling with so much junk inside of me. And I started questioning whether or not I even had a relationship with God because I was under the impression that if you had a rela- if you were bad and then you develop a relationship with God, you just become good and the badness goes away. But that wasn't happening with me. And when I read through Romans 7 for the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy gets me. This guy gets me. I was talking to Jenna last night about this verse. And she said, I love that verse. I quote it all the time. I think about it all the time because there is no one on planet earth that can't relate to that verse. Totally true. The good things that I know I should do, I don't do. And the bad things that I know I shouldn't do, I keep on doing those things. What's wrong with me? Paul giving voice to that stuff saved my life, helped me tremendously. Um, And so just knowing that, knowing that I don't have to change anybody, I can't change myself, I can't change the world, I can't change you, sets me free. So back to the word picture. So I'm thinking, what's the, like, what word picture can I create? And I thought to myself, what is the Christian life? The Christian life, or I I think I put it like this, the gospel is the breaking open of the piñata, and the Christian life is just a life picking up the candy. That's it. That's what it is. The piñata has been burst wide open, and what is our life supposed to look like? Just pick up the candy and enjoy it. That's it. Enjoy the gift. Simply enjoy the gift I posted something on social media, uh, maybe it was yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, Uh, but it was something along these lines, and uh, somebody said, responded in the question, I mean, with a question in the comment section and said, okay, so what do I do now? And I just said, enjoy the gift, (laughs) relax, exhale, take a deep breath, dance, sing, laugh, cuss, Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your family. Uh, go, to a, go to a concert. Go see Alanis Morissette at the I Think Amphitheater. I don't care. Just enjoy your life. Knowing that God loves you and knowing that God loves you will begin to change you, soften the rough edges, make you more forgiving, make you a little bit more empathetic. Make you, the more you soak in that truth, the softer you become. 
We think that becoming more like Jesus requires a real effort to become like Jesus. Good luck with that, okay? Um, Becoming more like Jesus happens organically as we simply sit with him, laugh with him, talk to him, nurture our friendship with him. And then he begins to rub off on us. And we wake up one day, maybe 10 years from now, and go, wow, I'm a lot more forgiving than than I used to be, and I haven't even been trying. I'm a lot more empathetic and compassionate than I used to be, and and I'm not even trying. What's happened to me? You've been sitting with Jesus. That's what's happened to you. That you just soak in the hot tub of that forgiveness that is yours. It seeps in, and it begins to take root, and you realize, I'm a different person, and I haven't even been trying. We don't become different by hearing sermons on how to be different. We don't become better husbands and better wives and better friends and better parents by reading books on that stuff. Information is not our problem. The heart is the issue. And the only way that the heart is changed is by basking in the glow of what God has done for us in loving us, in giving himself to us, in forgiving us, in extending mercy and grace to us over and over and over again. That kind of love in the face of our failure softens us. I said it last week that someone asked me years ago, uh, what have you learned about God in the wake of your failure that maybe you didn't know before? And my immediate answer was his friendship. I mean, he's just been the best friend I've ever had. I have given him every reason in the world to bail, to walk away. And he sticks and he stays no matter what. Like Paul's all, God is not shocked by my sin. He's not shocked by my failures. He's not shocked by any of this stuff. Um, You know, people are much more likely to be honest if it's clear that there's forgiveness and grace on the horizon rather than judgment. That's what I love about the vault here at the sanctuary. The guys in that room are honest. I mean, there's some earthy talk in that room. There's some stuff that's going on and stuff that has happened and stuff that will happen. And the guys talk openly about that. Some of them are more salty than others. Some of them use more saltier language than others. But we're not trying to change anybody in that room. We're not trying to fix anybody in that room. And because they know that, that's what gives them the willingness to tell the truth. Because people are much more likely to be honest if it's clear to them that there's forgiveness and grace on the horizon rather than judgment. If you're fearful that you'll be judged harshly, if you're honest, you'll never be honest. None of us will. So I don't preach to fix people, improve people, or change people. I preach to tell people that God loves them no matter what. And I leave all the fixing, improving, and changing up to God. He can do with that what he wants. That's his business, not mine. When, I, when I'm operating with the I have to fix you kind of mentality, I'm operating way above my pay grade at that point. We all are. I mean, think about it. None of us like being around someone who's always trying to fix us, always giving advice, always offering solutions when we come to them with their problems. It's a strict rule we have at the vault. If there's no advice giving, there's no fixing, there's no problem solving, there's listening, there's empathizing. But if you love people no matter what, you might just discover that loving them does improve them. That over time, loving them does change them. That over time, loving them does fix some things about them. Change is always the fruit of love. Always. How do people change? Do they change by being told what to do? I mean, how well does that work? And I'm talking about real change, like heart level change. Does that happen by being told what to do? I mean, being told what to do and what not to do 
might expose the fact that we need to change, but that kind of exhortation, instruction, and so forth, that isn't the actual change agent. Law cannot change a human heart. That's the entirety of Romans chapter 7. Paul says, in fact, I thought that I was keeping the law. I thought that I was obeying God's rules until I really started seeing the law for what it was. And then I realized I'm a lot worse than I think I am. And there's nothing I can do to change it. No amount of law keeping is changing me. At least not changing me where it matters. It might mitigate some bad behavior here and there for fear of consequences, but it's not changing me where it matters. So how does change happen? Does it change by being told what to do, being told what not to do? It's never the way change happens. Law can't change anybody. Only love can. So if you love people no matter what, even when they're being bad, what you'll discover is that loving them starts to improve them in some ways. Loving them does start to change them in some ways. Loving them softens them in some ways. I don't know if you've paid attention to what's happening in sort of uh, Christian superstardom news, Uh, but there have been a couple of very well-known pastors in Texas, in Texas, okay? Uh, There have been a few, two well-known pastors in Texas, uh, one in the 60s, one in his 70s, uh, who recently stepped down because of some serious, serious sins in the past that were exposed, destructive stuff. And when I read that stuff, because I lived through that, when I read that stuff, my heart almost always, I'm thinking about all of the people that are affected by it, okay? Because I think about all the people that were affected by what I did. I think about my kids, I think about my family, I think about the people that were in the churches that I led, I think about that and and how I let them down and how they looked to me to be a spiritual leader and a teacher and a friend and I let them all down. I, in some cases, shattered their worlds. And so I think about all of the victims in that regard, but I also think about the perpetrators. I think about the guilt and the shame and the loss and the regret that they will now live with for the rest of their lives. And it's big news. These people were public figures, and so their sin is public. I think what troubled me more than anything, though, was just how quickly the Christian community just jumps on them. I mean, jumps on them. And I mean, listen, you can be guilty of the most heinous things in the world, and for the Christian community to first come out with an attitude of, vengeance and retribution rather than redemption and reconciliation shows that we are way off message. Now, we've believed something about Christianity and about God for a really long time, and it's affecting the way we think about sin and sinners. And it's deluding us to think that whatever anybody's ever been guilty of on the outside, I have been just as guilty on the inside over and over and over again. We don't like to know, we don't like to believe that stuff about ourselves. We don't like that. We don't, we don't want, we want to rip verses like this out of the Bible. I don't like this. I want to be told that I'm good and I'm strong and I'm capable and I'm all of these things. Well, in some ways you are. If you're out of shape, you can get in shape. Uh, You know, if you want to live a healthier life, you can live a healthier life. I mean, our choices have consequences, both good and bad, so there are some things. But ultimately, when it matters most before God, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have a friend who once said that most Christians affirm the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but that never prevents us from comparing distances. (laughs) Well, he's fallen farther than I have. She's fallen farther than I have. Um, So grace and practice is what the sanctuary is about. Now, we'll fail at this. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not very good at this. I think I'm a little bit better than I used to be. And I can, grace on paper, I'm in my element when it comes to that stuff. I can write books about it. I can preach sermons about it. I can articulate it. Grace and practice, when someone wrongs me, when someone hurts me, when someone... Uh, 
That's, and, and grace in practice does not always mean, okay, someone has really hurt me, they've abused me, they have taken advantage of me, and I just have to sort of let them continue doing it. That's not grace in practice, okay? Let me make that very clear. That's not grace in practice. Uh, grace in practice means over time, as God continues to work on you, you become increasingly able to forgive that person, not that you'll be back in a relationship with that person, but that you'll increasingly feel the freedom of holding a grudge against that person. Um, I want to I conclude with this. I, uh, <clears throat> I wrote this when I was on an airplane a couple weeks ago. I was thinking about a conversation that I had had I don't know, months earlier with a friend and I wanted to write about it, and this is what I said. How do you work God into a conversation with someone who doesn't believe in God? That's the question a friend asked me recently. I said, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I don't shy away from talking about God because that's who I am, but it's natural. It's never forced. I don't try and shoehorn God in every conversation. Whether or not they believe in God is none of my business. My friend had that confused look on his face. See, I don't treat people as potential converts or potential Christians or potential anything. I treat them as people, regardless of whether they believe in God or not. I actually enjoy people, and so I try, so I try to be a friend, listen to them, laugh with them, ask questions about their lives, basically try to treat people the way I'd like to be treated. But here's the deal. At some point, life will bite them in the ass. It bites us all. They'll have a losing season, like we all do. They'll lose a job, a spouse, a child to any number of things, possibly even death. They'll lose their health, their sobriety, their minds. They might lose it all. Who knows? It's a shit deal, but that's the deal. Yet, in those seasons, if I've been a genuine friend to them, they often reach out to me. Not always, but often, because they need a friend. My friend Paul Zoll once told me, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Which means that none of us are really ready to listen until we lose. Then, it's possible that we're open to this thing called grace, because we're hurting and human and in need of the God who so loves us even if we don't know it. So I don't try to convert people. That's way above my pay grade. I just try and love them, enjoy them, and maybe, just maybe, when the student is ready, I might be the teacher who appears, or better yet, the friend. It will make every relationship you have breathe easier if you can get your head and heart around this idea that it's God's job to change people and it's our job to love them. When that becomes your MO in your relationships, those relationships get better. That person starts to get better. Those relationships get closer, more intimate. That's how God does it with us, loving us no matter what. And the more we believe it, the softer we become. Let's pray together. God, we believe this stuff and we don't believe this stuff. So help our unbelief. We pray these things in Jesus' name.